live around in the area? Actually, I live in Crystal City. Oh, I'm yeah, not sure whether yeah. you, uh, you know, when you go across the 14th Street Bridge, uh, coming out of the Pentagon, you actually come into Pentagon City, you know, if you come out south, yeah. out of the south parking lot. And that's essentially Crystal City right down in there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we have an apartment over on 15th Street. Yeah, we do a lot of shoots in the double, the, uh, double tree. Yeah, okay, all, all okay. And if you know where, are you familiar with Water Park? It's right on Crystal Drive. It's this, this huge waterfall. People love to go there. It's a favorite spot for wedding photographs and, oh, yeah. uh, and all of the kind of stuff. There's a VRE yeah. train station yeah. right next to it. Yeah. That apartment complex at the VRE train station is where we live. Oh, right wow. across the street from Hamburger Hamlet. Oh, nice. If you've ever been to Hamburger Hamlet. I haven't got it. <laughs> it's a great eating place. to become a Marine. I, I, um, I actually grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, in seventh grade I saw a program on television called Men of Annapolis, and it was about life at the Naval Academy. Um, I fell in love with the Naval Academy, decided this was where I wanted to go to school, and uh, long story about how I got here, but when I was finally on my way, I thought about things I wanted to do. I didn't know very much about the Navy, didn't know, didn't know very much about the Naval Academy except what I had seen on television, but I knew two things. I knew I was not going to be a Marine, when I graduated, and I was also not going to fly airplanes. So those were the two things that I brought from high school. When I got here, the way this, the program is set up at the Naval Academy is uh, every midshipman belongs to a company. And uh, my company officer my first year was a Marine, a major by the name of Major John Riley Love, who was uh, incredibly uh, strict, uh, but unbelievably fair. And he reminded me a lot of my dad. And, um, he became a role model and a mentor to me my first year. Uh, that was his last year at the Naval Academy, but over the next uh, course of my time here, I, I would reflect back on him, and when it was time to decide what I wanted to do, uh, in spite of what I had said, I said I want to be like him. So I decided I was coming into the Marine Corps, and that, that's how it happened. All right. too was uh, one of these things like becoming a marine although I said I would never fly airplanes um, when I got to the basic school and, and I think most of the audience may know that every marine officer has to go through the basic school it's a six-month course of study down in Quantico and and I was going through the basic school in the fall and winter uh, we came to our three-day war at the end of sort of your graduation exercise it was cold and snowy and there was ice on the ground and for three days I thought I was gonna die it was so cold and I made up my mind then that I, in spite of the fact that I thought I wanted to be an infantry officer, that just was not what I wanted to spend, how I wanted to spend my life. My wife had never been enamored with the thought of me being an infantry officer either. And we thought about it and she said, why don't you go to Pensacola? You know, you have an option to go to flight school. And I said, yeah, but I don't really want to fly. And, and we talked about it for a while. We said, okay, I'll try it. And I went to Pensacola. First time I got in an airplane after going through the ground school part, um, Soon as the wheels lifted off, I mean, it was incredible. The, the feeling of exhilaration and everything, and I fell in love with it, and I knew that I had made the right decision. So I, I stumbled into flight school. All right. Now, what was Marine Corps like, like for you? I spent 34 years on active duty in the Marine Corps. I, I am still a Marine. I'm just not, uh, just not actively with Marines all the time. But uh, it was an incredible 34 years of active duty service. In the middle of that 34 years, I was away from the operating forces. I actually spent my middle 14 years um, detailed to NASA uh, with the astronaut office down in Houston, Texas. But, but I always stayed uh, connected uh, to my Marine Corps roots. And it was just uh, being with Marines and sailors is unlike anything else that, that I've ever known in my life. They're in, you all, not they. Uh, you're incredible people. And uh, 
you know, incredibly motivated. Uh, you don't ask for a lot. Uh, you just say, okay, what does the American taxpayer and, uh, and the National Command uh, Authority want me to do? And you go do it. And, and I, my wife and I both love that. All right. Uh, going back a little bit, uh, what, are, what were some of your more memorable uh, experiences flying the A6? Oh, the A6? Yeah. Uh, it, it, the greatest airplane God ever allowed a human being to fly. And I still say that. I mean, I, you know, people ask a lot about what do you like to fly? But um, I must say that to this day, I don't think I ever flew an airplane with more capability than the A6. It was, uh, uh, it was built to be an all-weather attack aircraft. It had a single mission, uh, which it did incredibly well. The thing I really liked about it was the two crew members, the pilot sat on the left-hand side, the bombardier navigator sat on the right-hand side, where you could look at each other and you could talk. Uh, required extreme coordination. Uh, the bombardier navigator most of the times ran the mission, orchestrated where we were going, how we were going to get there, provided guidance to me as the pilot, and the pilot flew it. And, and you, this, this bond of trust uh, was necessary because, I mean, sometimes the BN was going to send you places that, you know, you say, can we really get through there or can we really get there? When you're down, you know, 500 feet flying through the mountains, um, you need to be able to trust the guy, that, the guy now or girl that's that's uh, doing the directing, and they need to be able to trust that you're gonna fly where they tell you to fly. So um, my time in Vietnam was incredible. I, I actually was in a squadron that was stationed in a place called Nam Pong, Thailand, uh, in the middle of the Thai jungle. It was affectionately known as the Rose Garden. And we were there toward the end of the, the actual conflict in Vietnam, and, and most of what we did was night all-weather interdiction. Uh, incredible missions, very taxing and very challenging. Um, but but in, in a weird sense, um, quite rewarding and enjoyable because you were able to meet the challenge. All right, uh, after the Vietnam War, you returned to the U.S. and uh, eventually became a test pilot. Yes. Uh, can you talk about some of the differences uh, and similarities? Uh, you mean between being a test pilot and a normal yeah. kind of pilot? I think the, the biggest thing, you know, I, from flight school, uh, where I had a, one of my instructors was a Marine who was a test pilot, a guy named Pete Field, uh, retired as a colonel in the Marine Corps, but he had actually been a test pilot for a while, he eventually became the, the project lead for the F-18 development program. But uh, when I talked to him, he always talked about what, it, what being a test pilot was really like, how demanding it was, how you had to do pre very precise flying, whether it was flying to within a, a knot in airspeed and a foot, uh, of altitude, and I think that's the big difference between what a test pilot does and what a normal pilot does. Pilots, as a general rule, have to be precise, but, but in test piloting, you have to be extremely precise and disciplined. Uh, they teach you how to observe. You have to be very observant of what's going on, whether it's in the cockpit or outside, because all that becomes data, becomes input into the performance of the airplane. You're really, as a test pilot, you're really trying to to make a determination as to whether the airplane or the weapon system that's being used in that airplane is going to be uh, useful and easy for a pilot or a crew member to use. And, and you have to be taught to do that. So that's probably the biggest difference. All right. Uh, how hard was it to return to the uh, Naval Academy as the deputy commandant of midshipmen? I, uh, nice. My wife and I were a little bit hesitant if you will, uh, but immediately upon arriving here we found that it, the transition was going to be very easy. Um, it was a, a tremendous transition because we had come from living in the civilian world 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, to being back here where we lived on the yard. Uh, we were with midshipmen all the time. We were immersed in their lives and they became a part of ours. Uh, it was great to be able to get up at, at 6 a.m. every morning and go out and, and PT with them during plebe summer. Um, my, I probably was in better physical shape than I'd ever been in the year that I was here trying to keep up with 17 to 21 year old young men and women from all over the world. Uh, it was an absolutely incredible experience for us that year here and the transition was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, it really, that year here really helped me smooth my transition back into the operating forces of the Marine Corps. because. My task here was to help the superintendent and the commandant run the Naval Academy. Uh, I had primary responsibility for the leadership training of the Marines um, and of the midshipmen. And so that was an incredible uh, help in getting me ready to go back to the fleet. All right. And uh, 
The uh, training that the Marine Corps and the Navy gave you uh, obviously was a help in bringing you to NASA. Yeah. Uh, can you go into further detail about how some of the training helped once you got yeah. there? I will tell you, my training here at the Naval Academy and in the Marine Corps supplemented what my mom and dad gave me growing up. I, as I said, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. My mom and dad were school teachers. Uh, they were relatively demanding. You know, they, um, they were incredible, incredibly um, inspirational parents. But for my brother and me, they, all they demanded was that we do our best in everything we could. They, they never, uh, they never would allow us to accept the fact that there was something we could not do. They always said, you know, you can do anything you want to if you put your mind to it and if you're willing to study. When I came into the into the Naval Academy, my four years here, and then my subsequent training and experience in the Marine Corps, uh, here I learned um, what some of the lessons I was able to put labels on some of the lessons that my mom and dad and my church had taught me: honor, courage, commitment. The things that they had told me about being honest with people, never telling a lie, you know, every kid does it, but, but, but you worry about it. You know, if your parents have taught you well, uh, even, a, even a little white lie bothers you, and it, and it did me. So honor became something that I had lived all my life, and, it, and, and it, uh, you know, my experience in the Marine Corps trying to lead Marines and sailors, it instilled in me the importance of knowing that as long as I was honest with my Marines and sailors, they would support me. If I ever lied to them, or if I ever deceived them, then I was toast. Uh, the courage part, I learned that it's not just being able to stand up in front of somebody and take a bullet, but it's moral courage. It's doing the right thing all the time. It's being able to tell Marines and sailors that they're wrong when they decide that they're gonna discriminate against somebody because they don't look like them or they're not the same sex or whatever it is. And then the commitment part, putting yourself into something for your life. Uh, you know, you're both petty officers and uh, and you've been through a lot to get where you are, and you wouldn't be here were it not for your commitment to the Navy and, and to your sailors that you lead. And so, um, as I said, the Navy and the Marine Corps, just they prepared me for life, um, especially by making our, our core values come to life and really mean something more than just words. All right. Uh, what led you to decide to apply for the astronaut? Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I was goaded into it, and, that, and that's... I have to explain that. I, you know, I never dreamed of flying before I came to the Naval Academy and then decided I was going into marine aviation. Uh, really never dreamed of being an astronaut. I knew what astronauts were. I had, um, you know, I had watched the earlier astronauts in the Mercury and Gemini programs. I was commissioned and in flight school when we walked on the moon. Uh, and although I was awestruck, it just never occurred to me that I could be an astronaut. But I did want to be a test pilot. And, uh, and while I was a test pilot, uh, a group of the first group of shuttle astronauts selected by NASA, the group that was selected in 1978, came back to Patuxent River, Maryland, where I was serving as a test pilot, and I met a lot of them. One of them was Dr. Ron McNair, who was killed on the Challenger crew. And Ron and I had grown up 42 miles from each other in South Carolina. He, like me, was African-American. His mom had been a teacher. Uh, Ron had always dreamed of being an astronaut, and, and I didn't know him, but we met that weekend and talked about how he had become an astronaut, why he wanted to do it. And before he left, he asked me if I was gonna apply for the program. I told him, not on your life. And he said, why not? I said, because they'll never pick me. And, and he looked at me and he said, you know, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Uh, here you are, you're a test pilot. How do you know if you don't ask? And, and it kind of struck me that, you know, I was going out talking to kids, trying to pump them up to do anything they wanted to do. And here I was, I had put this artificial limitation on myself. And so when NASA asked for people to apply for the second group of space shuttle astronauts, I decided I'd put my hat, my name in a hat. I did apply and I, I was selected to be interviewed in Houston and subsequently was selected for the second group of space shuttle astronauts. What was that feeling like when you were selected? Oh, to get the word? Uh, kind of euphoric, um, unbelief, I mean disbelief. I, I was still a test pilot when I was selected and I was actually dressed and walking out to uh, fly a a test hop in, a, in an A7 and uh, got a phone call at the ops desk and I answered it and it was a gentleman by the name of George Abbey who ran flight crew operations and was responsible for all the astronauts and he asked me if I still wanted to be an astronaut and I kind of halfway thought it was a joke and I said sure and he said uh, well uh, you know you've been selected in this next group of astronauts uh, how soon can you be in Houston I said I can be there tomorrow if you need for me he said well not not quite that fast but we need to have you here the first of July this was uh, 
the summer of 1980. And uh, in fact, it was my, my wife's birthday. It was May 31st when I got the call. So it was a, a huge day for the Bolden family. Uh, you know, we had two kids who were in school, my wife's birthday, and I got word that I'd been selected to become an, an American astronaut. So it was, it was unbelievable. All right. And uh, you're a veteran of four shuttle flights. Uh, at any time when something started to go wrong, uh, were you able to fall back on the train received in the Navy? I think I was always able to fall back on, the, again, the training and discipline taught by my mom and dad at home, the training and discipline uh, and, and I guess sense of staying calm that I got here at the Naval Academy going through summer cruises and all that, and then most especially the training and discipline that I got uh, as a Marine, whether going through survival school or doing anything else, um, you know, and learning that no matter how bad things seem to be, um, you know, they could always be worse. So just don't make it worse yourself. Kind of settle down, evaluate the situation, which is what you learn as a test pilot. Uh, make sure you know what's going wrong the first time, and then before you do anything, before you touch anything, make sure that you and somebody else agree on it before you take action. And, and fortunately for me, on four space shuttle missions, we never had anything drastic go wrong. We, we had what we considered to be minor problems. And, and ironically, the most serious problem in my whole uh, four flights and, and my whole 14 years in the space program was losing communications with the ground for about a two hour period of time. And that's a, in the space shuttle, you know, when you're, you're 250 miles above Earth and, and the shuttle knows where it is, but, but may not know precisely if you have to make an emergency deorbit and landing, you really want it to know where it is, and in order to do that, the ground's got to be able to talk to it. So that's, loss of communications is one of the more serious problems you can have in the space shuttle. So you've never had a radio in Houston? Uh, never had to, wait, you know, never, never had to say, Houston, we have a problem. All right. In the, in the first two uh, shuttle missions you were on, you were the pilot and there were the commander of the last two. Uh, yeah. How different are those roles? The difference in the pilot and commander's role is, um, the biggest difference is the commander is, has overall responsibility for the execution of the mission, the training of the crew, uh, and the safety of the crew and vehicle. Uh, the pilot is, is to assist the commander, so it's like being the, the big pilot in an airplane and the co-pilot. Um, both are trained to land the shuttle. Both can do everything, you know, you can switch off whether it's, we never fly the shuttle during ascent. Um, it, the computers fly it. We were trained to do it if we had to. We don't fly much of the descent and entry, the computer does it, but we're trained to do it if we have to. And in the end, the last three minutes, once we go subsonic, the pilot and commander actually get a chance to put their hand on the stick and fly a little bit. And the pilot flies the first half, usually the first half of the approach, and then the commander takes over and actually lands the vehicle. So uh, responsibility, prime responsibility for the crew and vehicle and its safety is the, is the commander's responsibility, and ultimately landing the shuttle and then being the right-hand person, the, the assistant, it, there to step in if need be, is the pilot's duty. All right. And uh, was there a naval aviator turned astronaut that you aspired to be? I don't think I ever aspired to be anyone. Um, there are a number that I admired. I think you may have interviewed one, Jim Lovell. Uh, Captain Lovell, to me, is, is absolutely incredible. Not, not just because of the type of astronaut he was, not just because of how he kept his composure and how he you know, is, is told to have commanded Apollo 13 in the face of incredible adversity, but how he has been uh, an incredible human being and contributor to mankind, humankind, since leaving the astronaut office and going into business and even today, uh, the way that he deals with people. He's incredibly down to earth. The other person is Alan Bean. Uh, Al Bean was, um, was uh, actually, my mentor when I first came into the astronaut office. It was, it, was, it was ironic and weird, to be quite honest. Here we had this guy who had walked on the moon, and he was, he was assigned to babysit uh, the 19 Americans and two Europeans in my group who were brought in as the second group of space shuttle astronauts. And Al essentially lived with us for the first year. He traveled with us, he did everything, time away from his family, and, and yet it was as if he was one of us who was a lot more mature, and I shall never forget, you know, what he did in helping us come along. And then, I think the third person would be um, would be Colonel Jack Lausma. Uh, Jack, Jack was uh, was a Marine in the astronaut office when I got there. 
He had actually been on one of the Skylab missions, one of the long duration missions on America's first uh, space station that they had called Skylab. And, and then he had been uh, the commander on STS-3, the third space shuttle launch. Um, and every time I was walking through the halls, I'd always, you know, you wore civilian clothes and you were not, you didn't go by titles or anything in the astronaut office. And I'd always call him sir. And he pulled me into his office one day and he said, you know, you, you're causing me a lot of grief. He said, would you just call me Jack? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I walked out of his office. But he and his wife, Gracia, um, incredible family people, uh, a man of great faith. Um, and uh, so he really encouraged me as I, in my early years in the, in the astronaut office until he left. So those are just three. I, I could name more, but, but those are the three that immediately come to mind. Uh, can you talk about the similarities between a uh, mission with a jet fighter and a space mm -hmm. mission? Well, I, I make the distinction between fighters and attack airplanes. So I'm not a fighter pilot. And uh, even though I flew the F-18 and learned how to do all that stuff, and I can talk with my hands, uh, I don't want to, to downplay the role of my friends who are real fighter pilots. I'm not, I'm not in their league. I, I'm a very good attack pilot. But the role of a space shuttle and any jet, military jet aircraft are significantly different. In a, in a military jet, a fighter attack aircraft, a fighter or an attack aircraft, uh, you know, you've got a specific mission to do um, and, and maybe one or two in the same time. You're gonna be flying over a period of anywhere from two hours to today, refueling and stuff like, like young men and women do in Afghanistan and places like that, maybe eight hours. Uh, you go do your mission and then you go back home and you think about it for the next day. Uh, you're really focused and really intent for a brief period of time when you're on target or over target, concerned about the lives of the Marines or sailors or airmen or, or soldiers who are down on the ground, but, but it's, it's short-term intense focus. In the space shuttle, as it used to be, because we're not flying anymore, but now on the International Space Station, where, where you're there for six months, it's more like a, like a, a marathon. So I would say, I comp when I compare shuttle and station, it's like a sprint compared to a marathon, because shuttle was days in length, the International Space Station, six months. Flying a jet airplane in combat and flying the shuttle is like a real sprint. I mean, the, the combat is a 100-yard dash. Um, flying the space shuttle or living on the International Space Station is like an ultra marathon where you're running a, a 100 miles and you've really got to pace yourself. Uh, I mean, and think about days and weeks instead of minutes and seconds, the way you do in a, in a fighter aircraft. Maneuverability-wise, um, you know, when you're in space, Gravity is overcome, so the shuttle is unlike anything that anyone has ever seen before. Because it's essentially, while well, it's going 17,500 miles an hour around Earth, on board, it's like you're just standing still. Gravity is overcome, so you float. Uh, you know, you move your head, your body follows. The shuttle can, can be maneuvered in any of all, you know, all directions. It can go up and down, sideways, fore and aft. It can roll, it can pitch, it can yaw, it, it can do everything. When you come back to Earth, it turns into a glider. It doesn't have any engines, so it's a, a big glider, huge glider. And, but, it, but it actually performs, it flies, uh, very similar to a, a fighter attack aircraft. Very maneuverable, although it's a huge, it's a behemoth kind of glider. All right, uh, now as head of uh, NASA, can you talk about how the Marine Corps and Navy got you ready for Oh, and it, an incredible preparation. I, you know, as the head of NASA, I'm responsible for about 17,000 civil service employees. And then while I don't have direct responsibility, I, I am responsible to my contractors. And they make up about a 40,000 person contractor workforce that, that do NASA's bidding. Um, the things that I learned going through training as a midshipman at the Naval Academy and then subsequently my 34 years in the Marine Corps, come into play every day, and, and you, would, you may or may not be surprised. Among those things are our core values. We deal with a lot of people. We deal with the Congress all the time. Uh, they depend on me being very honest and upfront with them. So again, going back to the core value of honor, uh, if, I, if I am honest and upfront with the Congress and the White House, the President, uh, even though I may have bad news sometimes, uh, most people can live with that. If I ever, ever, ever mislead them, uh, I'm history, I'm toast. So I remember that. Um, the courage means every once in a while, you know, when you're dealing with the president, uh, although I don't talk to him, I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't talk to the president every day. But when I talk to the people around him, every once in a while I have, I have bad news for him. 
uh, or I tell them that an idea that has sprung up is really not a good idea at all. Uh, so I have to have the courage to go in and, and tell my boss that uh, the baby's ugly, if you will. And, and I, I don't mind that because, uh, you know, the Naval Academy and the Marine Corps taught me that. And then the final thing is commitment. I love my job. Uh, I love my people. I love this country. And so I stay committed to it. You're being behind the stick in aircraft and then with NASA. How have you watched the changes in Navy and Marine Corps? Oh, geez. But I tell you, 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 it's hard to believe um, the magnitude of the changes in, in naval aviation and Navy and Marine Corps aviation just in the time that I've been involved. You know, we've been flying airplanes now for since, uh, since um, 1903. So a little bit more than 100 years, and we're celebrating the centennial of naval aviation this year. Um, the change from the Wright brothers uh, to an F-18 or an F-35 or an F-22 in the Air Force today is incredible. Uh, whether you're talking about speed, altitude, ability to, to deliver weapons precisely, uh, ability to communicate around the world, communicate with people on the ground, those are just incredible game-changing technological leaps that we've made and most of them have been made in my lifetime in naval aviation. I mentioned at the outset of this interview, the A6 is the most incredible airplane I've ever had been privileged to fly, but technologically it is dwarfed by what's in an F-18 or in an F-35. You know, it would have been great to have been able to look down into my lap in an A6 and see the ground the way that a pilot can with a you know, the helmet mounted cameras and everything else and the sensors in the skin of the F-35. Uh, that's mind boggling. To be able to look through your seat at somebody that's hopefully not behind you, but, but if you're bad enough that you let them get on your tail one day. I mean, those types of technologies are absolutely incredible and mind boggling. They have helped us get to where we are in terms of space exploration. You know, it's, it's those types of developments in aviation that have enabled us to bring about a space shuttle, for example. Um, people sometimes forget that things like the space shuttle or even a capsule, uh, at some point in their life, going into space and coming back, they turn into aerodynamic vehicles. And even if it's a cone, it's got to be able to glide through the atmosphere and make a landing somewhere in the ballpark for where we want it. That's what naval aviation teaches, precise landings. We're not like the Air Force. You know, we don't come back to a runway and set it up, and if we land anywhere on the runway, it's okay. When you're coming back aboard a carrier, I mean, you've got to be very precise. Uh, you can make, you can trap on one of four wires. If you miss them, then you're toast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's just a, a level of precision uh, that is unprecedented. We do the same thing in the space program. When we bring somebody, when we put somebody on another planet, as we are going to do when we go to Mars, we've got to be able to make a carrier landing. We've got to be able to, to send them to a very precise, precise spot on the Martian surface that we know it's going to be safe and level and everything else. When we sent Neil Armstrong to the surface of the moon, what was most incredible about that, most incredible about that was it was a, it was a precise carrier landing. We knew where we wanted them to be. Uh, Neil was able to take over manually because he found that where he was going to land, that precise, precise spot, was a little bit rougher than we had thought, and so he moved just a little bit you know, to one side and landed safely. And that's, that's the kind of precision that's required when you're going to another planet uh, many, 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 many millions of miles sometimes away from Earth. All right, uh, where do you see aviation going in the next yeah. century? It's going to be tough uh, because we all know that we're, we're turning more and more to unmanned aerial systems. Um, I hope, uh, to be quite honest, I hope that we will never move completely away from, from human systems, human operated systems. Uh, I, I, like everybody else, can see the handwriting on the wall because it's, uh, people feel that it's safer for crew members to be able to hand off uh, some of the more risky missions to a, a robotic vehicle. We're doing the same thing in the space program. When I, when I send humans to Mars, uh, in your lifetime by the way, um, they will be arriving at a base camp that a robot has set up. Uh, I won't be sending astronauts to the surface of Mars to build a camp. Uh, wherever they're going to live and work will have already been established and will already have been put in place probably by, by a robotic precursor. And, and regretfully, 
Um, I think that's the way that naval aviation and aviation in general in the future is going. I think we're not very far off from passengers going to, to uh, Dulles Airport or Baltimore Washington International getting on an airplane and there being no pilot in the cockpit for them to say hello to. Uh, you know, it's going to be a remotely piloted uh, aircraft that's carrying hundreds of people from point A to point B and it's just a fact of life. All right, uh, with aviation becoming as advanced as uh, it has become, uh, would you climb behind today's fighters? Oh, I, I, I would climb into anything today, past, present, even future. I, um, I'm not a daring individual, but I, but I have been taught through the years that if you study what it is you're about to do and prepare yourself well uh, and practice, whether it's in a simulator or something else, uh, you can do anything. And so I would, I would love to, to climb into the seat of uh, any of the modern day airplanes or, or any of the, the future airplanes that we're going to fly. Uh, is there any message you'd like to give to uh, any of the Marines or sailors? Yeah, I, I, I would. Um, you know, and I would, I would tell them to, as, they, as you all have been taught, whether going through recruit training or officer candidate school or whatever, uh, to really understand that, that we have a set of principles that are unlike most others, and, and those are our core values, honor, courage, and commitment. And I would say, you know, make them mean more than just words to you. Just make them understand that they are principles by which we live. And, and, and finally, I would tell them, really study hard in the pursuit of their goals, work very hard toward those goals, and whatever you do, don't ever be afraid of failure. Don't, don't ever let somebody like I believe one time, don't ever let somebody else tell you what you cannot do. So those would be my, my message. All right. Anything you'd like to add? No, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to do this interview. And I, I wish you the best, both of you the best of luck. All right. Thank you. That's it.